All right. Hello, guys. Uh, welcome back to the channel. Of course, my name is John. Um, and uh, I, I feel that I should say something to address what's going on in the world uh, before I get started on today's video, because, of course, it's, it's hard not to comment on uh, the, the murder of George Floyd, the ongoing protests in the United States and around the world, the horrific, horrifying uh, police brutality that has, uh, you know, that has greeted those protests, and the disgusting response from the from you know Donald Trump, uh, and you know, it's. I think that's one of the reasons that it took me so long to make this video is uh, is actually because uh, I just, you know, I've been so glued to the news. Like I haven't spent a lot of time reading books uh, in the past uh, couple of weeks just because I'm so focused on, on trying to keep myself informed. And I think that, well, for one thing, I really do admire and in some ways even envy the people who have had the opportunity well opportunity is the wrong word the people who have been forced to respond to the injustice by going out and protesting um as some of you may know well you should know if you've been watching the this channel uh i live in beijing china uh so Naturally, there have been no protests here because that kind of thing is not really allowed in China. Um, and I, I have my thoughts on that as well, but I'm going to keep them to myself for now. But, uh, you know, I, I remember um, a few days ago, my brother and his family uh, posted on Facebook that they had gone to one of the, their local protests. And I just, I, I wish that I could have been there. I really do. Um, it sometimes does feel disheartening uh, to see everything going on in the United States, whether it's these protests, the, the COVID-19, the, um, the presidential election, of course, and to know that it's so far away from where I am now that there's really nothing I can do aside from, you know, share links on Facebook or uh, nowadays, I guess I can comment on it on, on YouTube. Uh, and it just feels like nothing, you know, and it is nothing. And that's the, that's kind of a hard thing to, to come to grips with is that, you know, ultimately short of discussing and, educating myself and, you know, promoting, uh, or not promoting, but like encouraging others to, to do the same, there's very little that I, that I feel like I can do. And that is really disheartening at times. Uh, and this has been something that I've been struggling with all year because I know, you know, in the US and in Europe where, I think the majority of the people that uh, that watch these videos for what small a group of you there are, are in the US or Europe. Um, you know, you guys have been uh, subject to lockdowns and restrictions for a few months now. Uh, my lockdown started in January. And only now is it starting to open up again, really, uh, only in the past several weeks. Um, Actually, yesterday I stepped outside to go to the convenience store and buy something to eat, and it was the first time since I think the first week of February, maybe the second week of February, that there was no guard stationed outside the front gate of my apartment complex, uh, checking, <clears throat> taking temperatures and checking IDs uh, to make sure that no non-residents were entering, um, and you know when I saw that there was no guard there, I just wanted to like jump up and down out of sheer joy because it just felt like a, 
a weight has been lifted off my shoulders, um, that things are starting to go back to normal here in Beijing. And now I just have to wait for the rest of the world. And um, I hope we get there. I hope we get there soon because this is, this is kind of the, the biggest thing for me is right now, if I leave China, I cannot come back because the Chinese government does not allow foreign nationals to enter its borders because of the COVID-19 crisis. And there is no indication that that is going to change anytime soon. Um, the speculation is that it might change in October if things get better around the world, but who knows? So at least until then, I'm kind of stuck here. And that's a little bit frustrating as well. Um, of course, that's just frustrating for me on a personal level. That's nothing compared to the um, the brutal murder of George Floyd or of the um, several people now uh, who the police have killed during the protests. Uh, that's nothing compared to the hundreds of thousands of people who have died from COVID-19. Um, you know, my own small, petty, personal problems pale in comparison to those. And I feel like I'm very lucky to be in a place where um, the, the worst is over as far as the virus is concerned. And, you know, I just, I don't know what to say, <laughs> except for, except that I hope that, um, I hope that things get better soon. And, I encourage everyone out there to educate yourself, uh, do your reading, do your research on, on police brutality, uh, on um, the history of racialized uh, uh, police policing, uh, on the COVID-19 crisis, <laughs> on everything, um, because, you know, no one is going to do the research for you. And the more you know about the world, the better you can respond to it. That That's all I can say at this point. So that brings me to the book that I have been reading during the, the my few breaks from, from reading the news and being devastated by it, which is this one here, Records of the Historian by Sima Qian. Uh, retold by Wang Guojin. Uh, and notice there, it says, it does not say translated by, it says retold by. And I think that's a kind of an important distinction here. I have to say, I don't actually know what Wang Guojin's process was in making this book, because unfortunately, this particular edition has absolutely no critical uh, apparatus whatsoever. There's no translator's notes. Uh, there's no acknowledgement, acknowledgements. There's no introduction. There's no uh, conclusion. It's just the text. And because I have not read any, uh, any Sima Qian, um, except for this, it's very hard for me to say how much of this is an actual translation and how much of this is just Wang Guojin giving us the gist of the story. Um, that said, what we have here are um, sort of biographical, um, biographical sketches of key figures from early Chinese history. Um, and I do, I do mean early Chinese history because um, Records of the Historian uh, was written in I believe like something like the 1000s BC, something like that. Um, again, no critical apparatus here, so I can't quickly glance at it. I, I could of course Google it, but you know, I'm not gonna do that right now. Uh, but anyway, um, and uh, it's interesting. It's a bit almost like um, the Plutarch's lives uh, in a Greco-Roman context. Um, these are the, uh, 
what makes these historically important, not only is it a, an incredible source of, um, uh, of information about a very early time in uh, Chinese history, but it's historically important because this provided the model for the official histories or the also known as the 24 histories, uh, which would come later in, in, Chinese, in Chinese history. Um, essentially, the idea was that at the beginning of a new imperial dynasty, an office would be established by the, by the new dynasty to write the history of the previous dynasty. And they would use this book or the, well, the original records of the historian anyway, as a model uh, of how to do that. And the, the model that they were following was highly like biographical. It was very much great man kind of history. So for a modern reader, looking at it, it's a little bit, it feels like it's missing something because what you have here are uh, important moments in the lives of generals, scholars, um, officials, uh, kings and emperors. What you don't have here is any sense of the everyday life of normal people because it wasn't it just wasn't considered important uh, from the point of view of the people writing the the books so there are a few hints here and there of that kind of thing um but for the most part this is official history this is um you know the history of ruling dynasties and how they managed the country what's really kind of disappointing to me is that throughout this book there are hints of really fascinating, amazing stories that I just want to know more about. You know, there's, um, I, I, in particular, I remember there was one uh, point where <clears throat> it was talking about, or the book was talking about a, uh, an official who was known for his corruption. And the, the official and one of his henchmen were in a, in a besieged city and in a one sentence uh, explanation of how he got out of the city and left to another city, it said, um, and then he sent out thousands of women from the West Gate to fight the army and he and his henchmen fled from the East Gate and escaped. Okay, what happened to the women? You know, what happened to this? Uh, and not only what happened to them, where did they come from? Were these uh, were these trained female soldiers? Was this like a Mulan kind of situation? Or did he just like sacrifice the female population of the city so he could make his escape? That's not in here at all, because the point of the story isn't what happened to the city or what happened to the army or what happened to the women or even what happened to the war. It's what happened to this guy. And that is really frustrating uh, because I want to know so much more about the rest of the story. Uh, the other thing that's a little bit frustrating about this one, and this is something that I've noticed a lot in uh, Chinese editions of um, kind of classical Chinese texts, is that um, the, the transliteration conventions are a little bit strange. Uh, nowadays, um, Chinese, the Chinese language or the Mandarin language, I suppose, uh, is usually transliterated in one of two ways, um, either in what's called pinyin, which is the official system that's used in mainland China, the People's Republic of China, as well as in Singapore. Um, and it is, pinyin is very close to a perfect phonetic representation of the Chinese language. The only issue that it has sometimes is uh, is representing tones because it's kind of inconsistent whether they're whether tone markers are used or not and tones are really important in chinese so there's that um there's also uh what's called the wade giles system which is the official system in use in taiwan uh and in hong kong and macau and wade giles is um it's an older system and it's not as precise. Uh, so just to give you an example of the the problems with um, with Wade Giles compared to Pinyin, um, I'll, I'll tell you about a historical figure 
that is not in this book, much, much, much later in Chinese history, and that's um, Zhang Jiaxi. Uh, so, and I'm pronouncing it a little bit off, but not too much off. So Zhang Jiaxi was the uh, nationalist leader of, uh, of the Republic of China uh, during, well, before and during World War II. Uh, he was the leader who, you know, who led the nationalist forces to flee the mainland and set up in Taiwan. Um, and if that sounds familiar to you, you probably know him, if you're a Westerner, as Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, his name in Chinese is Zhang Jiaxi, but in, uh, in Pinyin, or it's, and in Pinyin, it's uh, spelled J-I-A-N-G-J-I-E-S-H-I, Zhang Jiaxi, which is pretty close to the Chinese. Um, in Wade Giles, it's spelled C H I A N G K A I S H E K. And the J to the K um, transition in the lat in the uh, in the given name portion, it's a pretty common thing. You can also see it, for example, in uh, Beijing versus the old name Peking. Um, but the K at the end is what really gets me because it just comes out of nowhere. Um, so yeah, if you've been calling him Chiang Kai-shek, if you come to China or to Taiwan or anywhere that speaks Chinese and call him by that name, people aren't going to know who you're talking about unless they speak English and are familiar with uh, English language sources about their own history. So anyway, uh, there's also a third system, which was called the postal code system, which was mostly abandoned um, by... I would say like the 30s or 40s, um, but you still see it in older names of, uh, of cities and, and towns and things like that. Um, I mentioned Peking as an old name of Beijing. Um, that actually does come from more the postal code system than the Wade Giles system. The same is true for Nanking instead of Nanjing. Um, let's see. Um, Canton instead of Guangdong, uh, places, things like that. So you see that sometimes with um, with place names and personal names, especially in older sources. And the weird thing to me is that a lot of Chinese editions, and this is a, a Chinese edition. It's printed by the China Intercontinental Press, which is a, you know a state-run organization uh, of the People's Republic of China. So you would think that they would use Pinyin because Pinyin is the official uh, method of transliterating Chinese in the People's Republic of China. Instead, they use like a weird combination of Wade Giles and postal code system. And it's really confusing. Um, so if you're reading this, uh, and, well, if you have no familiarity with Chinese history whatsoever, you're going to be confused no matter what, because there's a lot of names that are not given very much information or very much explanation. And as I said, there's no introduction, there's no conclusion, there's no um, glossary of names or anything like that. It's just the text. But even if you are a little bit familiar with Chinese history and geography, you're still going to be confused because the names that you know are probably in Pinyin, and the names here are unrecognizable from their Pinyin equivalents. Uh, so I do know a little bit about Chinese history. I've studied Chinese history a bit, and I don't know any of these people. <laughs> Maybe I know who they are if you give me their name in Pinyin, but I don't know any of the names in here. Uh, and the... Uh, the same is true for, of course, places. And with places, it's even more complicated because we're talking about cities like 5,000 years ago that in many cases no longer exist. Because there are a few genuinely old cities in China that are still important cities, but places like Shanghai, Bang, uh, Beijing, uh, uh, Nanjing, um, uh, Guangzhou, all of these places were founded as cities much later than the material in this uh, story or in this book. So, yeah, 
it's it's a little bit frustrating because you need a lot of background information to be able to make any sense of this. But even if you have that background information, it's still going to be confusing. So that's my biggest complaint. It needs more critical apparatus. It needs more introductions. Um, as far as the text goes, uh, it's valuable. It's very valuable. Um, I it's not particularly readable. I think even even without all of the uh, distractions from the outside world, it still probably would have taken me a while to get through this just because of how how difficult to parse a lot of it is. Uh, but I, you know what, I'll take what I can get because I mentioned those 24 histories of which this is the first one. There, there have so far been zero unabridged English translations of any of them. Uh, my understanding is, I believe Oxford University Press is currently working on an unabridged translation of Records of the Grand Historian. This one is just a, like a selection of stories from it. It's not the full thing, um, but it hasn't been released yet. And the remaining, uh, the remaining 23 of those histories have not been translated at all. Um, you know, a few excerpts have been published in uh, scholarly journals and things like that, but there's basically nothing in English um, from these sources. And it's really frustrating because just to have, you know, just when you think about like how rich of a vein of texts this is, um, you know, the, uh, the official histories of 5,000 years of history or more maybe, and we can kind of dip in here and there in, uh, you know, short retellings or brief journal articles or things like that. Like, there's so much that we're missing. And this is the perfect example of the reason I like to read these kinds of books. It's because, you know, I know that as an English reader, or as a Western reader, because it's not just a, a problem in English, of course. Uh, these things haven't been published in French or Spanish or German either. Um, I know that there's so much that I'm missing in the world. And like I know that there are huge, huge libraries, uh, huge traditions that exist in places like China, India, Mali, Ethiopia, um, you know, the Arab world, Iran, uh, Southeast Asia, that even if I want to, and I do want to, as a, a curious, um, you know, traveler and reader, uh, I want to read these stories. I want to see this history and, um, and hear these voices. But I know that there's so little of it that's available to me. Uh, and you know, I think this is very exciting when you do get something like this that makes it available to you, even as limited a volume as this one is. So that's that kind of brings me to the question, like, is this a good choice? Frankly, not really. Like, as I said, I one of the university presses. I'm pretty sure it's Oxford. I could be wrong. It might be Cambridge or one of the American university presses. I'm not 100% certain on that. But one of the university presses is currently working on an unabridged English version of Sima Qian's Records of the Historian. And when that comes out, I will get it. And when that comes out, I recommend you get it because the text is worth it. The information is worth it but it needs guidance if you're if you're unfamiliar with the if you're unfamiliar with the history if you're unfamiliar with the geography if you're unfamiliar with the names you will need guidance and this particular book just doesn't provide that which is a shame because you know we should be reading things like this and i think even though of course this is a, a chinese book um I think that's one of the things that leads us to the situation we find ourselves in in the news is that we do have a lack of curiosity or 
well, maybe not, maybe not you who is watching this, who is thinking about books and reading all the time, you might not have a lack of curiosity, but a lot of people do. A lot of people don't want to look past their own nose. They don't want to hear their neighbor's stories. They don't want to, um, you know, challenge their own experiences by thinking about other people's experiences. And when we don't do that, that's when terrible things start to happen in the world because that's when we forget that, you know, the, the black person warning us that the police are not our friends, uh, that they are, you know, that they are facing uh, constant, um, you know, constant lack of security, lack of safety because of the police, they get dismissed, you know. Oh no, the police are friendly. You know, I I wave hello to the to the cop on the corner every day. Well, okay, but your experience is not the only experience that's valid. Your experience is not the only experience in the world. So that's why I really encourage everyone to take the extra effort to step outside your comfort zone, to read things that make you challenge the way you see the world. Um, to look for other voices, other ideas, uh, not just things that make you happy, you know, things that make you uncomfortable are important to read. This particular book didn't make me uncomfortable. It made me a little bit confused, but that's all. But, um, but we should be reading books that do make us uncomfortable. And we should be having conversations that make us uncomfortable. And uh, and I'm realizing that the majority of this the majority of this video has nothing to do with records of the historian, because you know right now, quite frankly, there are more important things in the world than than my videos on YouTube. But I'm still going to make them for my own personal uh, mental health and. Uh, and to keep myself in the good habits of continuing to read uh, as much as I can, um, and to continue to challenge myself to seek out voices that I normally wouldn't hear. So uh, I guess that's it for today. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for, for listening. And uh, hope to see you next time. Bye.